So uh, welcome. Uh, this is Resilient Design 101. If you got here by accident, you've got about 10 seconds to go away. No? No takers? Cool. Awesome. So uh, my name is Avishai uh, Nukenberg on Twitter. It's uh, right here on the bottom. Uh, I work for Wix, Wix Engineering, uh, which you probably all know. Uh, we are about uh, 600 engineers at the moment, 2,000 employees, 100 million, 100 million users. Uh, we have about 500 microservices, give or take. I don't keep exact count, but that's like uh, the overall number. Uh, we have offices here in Vilnius, engineering offices here in Vilnius, in uh, Kiev, Nipro, Tel Aviv in Israel, and Beersheva also in Israel. We've got a bunch of other offices, uh, non-engineering offices around the, the world. Uh, actually, you don't really care about that. It's mostly for promotion and stuff. And yes, by the way, we're hiring. You, yeah, you know. So this is the part where I'm supposed to be talking about myself and my experience. So this is me uh, you know, giving a talk at some random conference. Uh, this is me debugging stuff. Um, can we do something about lights? No, yes? Awesome. Better. Yeah, the, those dull lights too. Yeah, you want to give it a try? Yeah, a little more. Awesome, great. A little more. Just a little more. Yeah, no, no, not this ones, no. Anyway, so this is me debugging stuff. Uh, this is me designing stuff. This is me coding with whiskey because I always code with whiskey. Uh, this is me after I deployed stuff to production, the thing that I coded. I'm very happy with myself. This is me 20 minutes later when I found the bug in production. Um, this is me in the postmortem. Yeah, yeah, it didn't go very well. Anyway, not the point really. Uh, we're here to talk about resilient design. Uh, the, th the first thing that people need to understand when we're talking about resilient design is Q-theory. Now, um, if you've heard about Q-theory, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, then it's worth saying a few words about what it is. Q-theory is a mathematical model, a mathematical theory, that was invented about 100 years ago by Erlang. Yes, Erlang is not only a programming language, it's also a mathematician. Um, and he invented queuing theory to model the, the waiting time that people had to wait when they waited for phone operators. Back in the day, you had actual people connecting wires in, uh, in, the, in the offices of the phone companies to get on switching boards, like physical large switching boards, to, to actually be able to make the call. So you would pick up the, uh, the phone and you would tell the operator, I want to talk to that guy, and someone would physically connect you. And you had to wait in line to get someone to take care of you. So Erlang did this uh, whole mathematical modeling in order to optimize the waiting time that you had to wait in line uh, for the phone. And actually, we use this theory everywhere. We use it to model uh, waiting lines in the supermarket. We use it on uh, amusement parks, theme parks, that kind, of, that kind of stuff. And of course, in computer systems. So um, what is a queue? And first of all, where do we have queues? So where do we have queues? We have queues everywhere. We have queues on sockets. We have explicit queues like uh, linked blocking queues in Java and so on, but we also have a lot of implicit queues in places you don't think about. For example, futures and executors always have a queue inside. Um, sockets always have a queue. Usually it's a kernel queue. Locks. Locks are not a queue per se, but they behave just like a queue. The mathematical modeling is the same. Synchronized DB connection pools, everything that, you know, uh, that has a lock. And of course, callbacks. I'm going to talk about the sync systems in a bit. But basically, anything that is asynchronous, somewhere inside there is a queue or something that behaves like a queue. And what is a queue? This is the basic model of what a queue is. It's a buffer. It has some capacity. Work goes in at some rate. We call it the arrival rate. And work goes out at some rate. We have a service center that takes the work out and processes it. We call it the service rate. And we have some strategy for taking jobs out of the queue. We call that the service discipline or the dequeuing strategy, whatever you want to call it. Uh, notable examples are FIFO, first in, first out, LIFO, last in, first out, and priority queue. There's also something called an Israeli queue. Uh, look it up, it's hilarious. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm going to make a cultural reference here, but basically it's a queue where when you take, when someone goes out of the queue, he brings his friends with him. Um, if you know Israelis, you know exactly why it's called like that. <laughs> 
it's actually quite useful, not, not the point really. Um, so we, we make an assumption here that the service time, the time it takes to process a job, is independent of the time you wait in the queue. Okay, that's an inherent assumption of the model. It's usually true. And latency, the time that you fill to get, to, to get service, is composed of the wait time, the time you spend waiting in the queue, and the time that it takes to actually process a job. So the, the problem with queues is that it's a lose-lose situation. Okay? We have some variation in the service rate and the service time and in the arrival rate and all of that. And this variation creates a, a pretty bad situation. Um, in a queue, you can only lose. If for some reason you have a job that is slower, then items will wait in the queue. Okay? And the queue will grow very, very fast. But if for some reason you finish the job earlier and the queue is empty, you don't actually get to save that spare time that you earned. Uh, you lose it because there's no job in the queue. You can't bank the spare time for later on. So in a, basically in a queue you can only lose. Okay? Delays accumulate and if you, got, if you did same things earlier, you did them faster, it goes to waste. You can't win. And this is the basic problem with the queue. The end result is that the queue is either completely empty or near empty, or completely full or you know, growing very, very fast. It's very, very hard to observe a queue that is you know, somewhere in the middle. In practice, it doesn't happen. And it's actually a nice exercise. If you go to a coffee shop or a supermarket, just take a look at the queue, spend like an hour or so uh, waiting, uh, watching the queue, and you will see that when it grows, it grows really, really fast. The end result is this. Okay, this is um, uh, called the MM1 model. It's a pretty simple model, uh, the simplest model I know of for, uh, for Q-theory. There are better models, but they all behave roughly the same way. When the queue starts growing, it grows really, really fast. This is the capacity of the queue on this graph, and what grows with it is the latency, okay, the time you wait on the queue. So, if the utilization, meaning the ratio between the arrival rate and the service rate, approaches one, approaches 100, latency and capacity and uh, the amount of items in queue start growing really, really fast. They go towards infinity if you have an unbounded queue. And that's a problem. This means that it's very, very easy to have a system with you know, really bad queue and quality of service and high latency and all the stuff that we want to avoid in resilient design. So the obvious solution would be to cap the utilization, to have over-provisioning. Uh, we try to preserve it below around 70%, so we don't go into this area. Um, that's the basic lesson here. Of course, we have to limit the queues. If you have an unbounded queue, and the queue will grow very, very fast, you will have out-of-memory errors. Okay? You will run out, on, out of uh, hip space, or you know, depending on the runtime, uh, maybe crash the machine even. And of course, you will have high latency and stale work. If some job wait in the queue long enough and you actually you know, process that job, it's a good chance that the other side, the client, has already timed out. Even if you actually deal with the job and you give them a response, no one is going to be listening to that response. Okay? Uh, for example, humans, they'll wait 10 seconds maybe. But if you process a job and you give them a response after 20 seconds, they're long gone. There's no point. So always, always, always limit the queue size. This is how you protect against high latency and out-of-memory errors. Now going back to the equation from before, this time if we substitute the utilization on top by service time, we will see that the latency is proportional to the service time. The degradation is proportional to the service time. This means that if you have a service center that is slower, the degradation is going to be much more severe. Uh, for example, if we're talking about SSD, SSD latency is around uh, 50 microseconds, give or take. And if you have, let's say you have a 50% uh, utilization rate, so you're roughly around here, the penalty is twice, 200%. So, okay, 50 microseconds penalty, that's not so bad in absolute terms. But if you're talking about uh, a magnetic drive where the latency is 10 milliseconds, and the penalty is 200%, um, 200%, yes, that's a big penalty suddenly. If you're talking about a slow microservice where, uh, let's say, uh, the latency is half a second, 
an extra half a second or a second extra is a very high price to pay. If you have a, a faster microservice, the same penalty in percentage is not so bad in absolute terms. So this means that the slower the service, the more over-provisioned it has to be. Okay? The more strict the protections that we apply to it must be. Now, utilization also fluctuates. It's not constant in time. And a 10% fluctuation in utilization can drive you all the way from this point in the graph to that point in the graph. If you're talking about 50% utilization and 10% fluctuation means that you would get to 55% utilization. That's a degradation of about 10% latency. That's not so bad. If you're talking about 90% utilization, 10% uh, fluctuation in latency, in, uh, sorry, in uh, utilization would drive you all the way to uh, about 10 times the latency. Okay, that's horrible. It basically means that your service is out. You have an outage. Okay? If you're driving your system near the edge of your capacity, then fluctuations are just horrible. And basically, the larger the variation that you have in service rate, service time, and, uh, and arrival rate, the more overcapacity you're going to need. Okay? Services or, uh, where the workload um, has a, a narrow distribution are much more efficient. So, we need to protect against this. We need to protect against sudden increase in load, sudden variations, uh, fluctuations, and so on. This means that we need to cap high load, and we need to use throttling and load shedding to protect against this. So what do we do in practice? First of all, we have to have choke points for load shedding and throttling. We have to have some points in the system where we protect the queues from uh, fluctuations and you know, from growing too much. Uh, second, we need to plan for low utilization of the slower resources. So an example would be if we have, um, usually we, it's much easier to do with microservices, but this example is for, uh, in your code. If you have a transaction that uh, uses two resources, one of them is a thread pool and uh, another one is a connection pool, and let's say that the database connection pool is much slower because the database is slower for some reason, then we would have to, use, to have a low utilization of that resource. Okay. Why? Because it's going to degrade faster. And of course, we need to have back pressure because if you have a series of queues, which is what you usually have, especially in uh, microservices architecture, then uh, if one of them clogs up, if, if one of the service centers is, slow, is uh, too slow, the front layer will not know about this and it will continue accepting more and more work and load will queue inside the system. So we need to have some way of letting the front layer know that it can't receive any more traffic, that it can't receive any more load, that it needs to reject and load shed. How do we do this? We do this with back pressure. Basically, the, the, the back end would tell its client, stop, too much, uh, too much work, I can't deal with this, and it, it, in its turn will do the same, and so on, so on, so on, until it reaches the front layer, and the front layer will reject the load. So a lot of protocols actually support this. Uh, HTTP, it's the 503 response. Okay? Um, and if you propagate this properly in the system, then your system will behave properly and it will load shed. If you don't, load will queue up inside the system and you will suffer from high latency and uh, you probably memory, uh, out of memory errors and so on. So a blocking system a blocking, blocking code, threaded code, synchronous code, is blocking, is, uh, has back pressure by default. How? Because it's blocking. When you block, you block your client, which blocks its clients, and so on, so on, so on. So it's basically a domino effect, and you get back pressure by default. Um, when you're talking about the synchronous stuff, like executors, futures, remote calls, and so on, they don't have back pressure by default, and you have to, um, to design for it and put it in place. For example, you actually have to handle 503s properly, which most people don't. Um, think about Kafka as a good example of a system where there's no back pressure. The consumer has no, um, the producer have no idea what the rate of the, uh, of the consumer is. If the consumer is much slower than the producer, then eventually the backlog will grow and grow and grow, you will have lags, and at some point you will start losing data, unless somehow you tell the producer to slow down. Not always it can slow down, in which case the only option is to increase the capacity or the, the, the speed of the consumer, 
But if it can slow down, then maybe you need to connect to the consumer, the consumer and the producer somehow and let the, and let the producer know to slow down. So once you have back pressure and the front layer knows that it has too much load, it has to load shed. How do we load shed? Um, there's a bunch of possibilities. You could return 503 to the client. You could reject excess work with some exception, or you could just not open you know, new connections. Uh, this is basically using TCP. Uh, to, do the, to do load shedding. You could maybe send traffic to an auxiliary server, maybe you know, uh, one that generates static responses, or maybe a different data center. There's a bunch of options that you can use. But you have to do this. It's basically a trade-off between latency and errors. Uh, the fundamental mistake here is refusing to return errors. If you do not return errors, then your latency will be bad, and you will have an, um, a site-wide outage as opposed to a partial outage. Okay, it's preferable to return errors to some clients than to have uh, all the clients suffer. And this is a good example, by the way, I, I highly recommend that you read it, of how Facebook did load shedding with LifoQ. Uh, basically, the strategy here was uh, designed uh, so that they would ha handle work that has higher chance of being completed, and not stale work. So um, if you care about that stuff, go and read it. So. Um, Let's talk about thread pools and now how they behave uh, given what we understand about queues. So this is uh, the general architecture of a, a synchronous threaded server. In Wix case, Jetty, but it, this applies to Tomcat and all the rest of, those, of the threaded servers as well. So we use Nginx as the load balancer or web server, whatever you want to call it. And Nginx would search, serve traffic to the application server. Now, the application server has a socket. And what do you have between the Nginx and the socket? Come on, you know this. Network. Network. Queue. Yeah, you have a queue. It's the kernel queue of the socket. It's called the backlog queue. And basically, any new connection that is opened would go in that queue. The default size is uh, 128. And then you have a thread in Jetty, accepted thread, usually more than one. And it would call accept, a system call, and uh, get the, the new connection from this queue, uh, open it up, start processing it, and put it here in this queue. This is a JVM queue. And it's connected to a thread pool known as the QTP, queue thread pool. This is the name in Jetty. And uh, this is where your code runs. This thread pool runs your code. Okay? It takes work from this queue and runs it. And of course, if this queue is too big, then you will have latency. But the question is, how many threads do we have? Because if we don't have enough threads, then of course work will queue up in the, in the, the Jetty queue. But if we have too many threads, we will also have problems. So if you have too many threads, you haven't actually done anything because work will still queue up, but instead of being queued up in the Jetty queue, it will be queued up in the operating system. The operating system has one large queue, it's the scheduler queue. Uh, you can see the, the average side of that queue if you do top and you look at the load average. Load average is actually an exponentially weighted average of the side of the queue. And you will have high latency waiting for CPU time. Also remember that each thread takes up memory. Uh, the stack size in Java, if I remember correctly, is by default one megabyte. So every thread takes up at least one megabyte, not including all the objects you've allocated to deal, to deal with the request file descriptors and so on. You have other resources like database connection pools, uh, database connections and so on, so on, so on. Um, eventually, if you use too many, uh, too many threads, you will get GC storms because all of them will take up memory um, or even out of memory errors and so on. And you will get really, really, really bad uh, quality of service and, and really bad uh, degradation behavior because of the queue here, the operating system queue. On the other hand, if you don't have enough threads, then work will queue up in the Jetty queue and you will get high latency. And also you won't be able to fully utilize the resources of the machine. You won't have enough threads to drive the, the CPU calls. So we don't want to be in this situation. We don't want to be in that situation. We want to have the exact balance of having the ex the, a good number of threads. So we need to tune this, we need to optimize. And what do we optimize for? This is the, the basic question. We cannot optimize both for latency and capacity and for throughput. So if we're optimizing for latency, what we would do is we would try to keep the queue as empty as possible. 
okay? Um, because we want uh, resources to be available whenever work come in, work come is, comes into the queue, okay? How do we do this? First of all, we block or apply back pressure to keep the load low, or at least lower than what we can handle. Remember, we want to have overcapacity. And we over-provision. We use more threads, more calls, more machines, and so on. On the other hand, if we're trying to optimize for throughput or capacity, and this is a batch system, basically, like Hadoop, we would do the exact opposite. We would try to keep the queue as full as possible. Basically, we want that every, uh, what we want is that every time a resource becomes available, it will have work waiting for it in the queue. Okay? So we would use a large queue, and we would try to keep, uh, to keep it as uh, full as possible. This has a side effect of an increasing latency, okay, which is why we can't optimize for both. So how many threads should we use? Um, there is a, a way to compute this. This is from Java concurrency in practice. It's basically a universal formula, but it does make an assumption that the limiting resource is the CPU, which is not always the case. Um, you can uh, pretty much understand the formula. It's not very complicated. It, it relies on the ratio between the wait time and the CPU time. Okay? Um, the problem that we have at Wix is that we can't actually use this formula, not only because CPU is not, only, uh, not always the limited resource, but because we share machines. We have multiple applications installed on, on uh, every machine. It's basically a grid. And because of that, we don't actually know how many calls we have per uh, JVM. So we can't actually use this formula. But if you do want to use this for formula, the way you would use it is you measure the transaction time, which is basically the wait time plus the CPU time. You can infer the CPU time by measuring the uh, total CPU time and dividing it by the throughput. You get an average. And of course, the utilization constant, like I said before, should be around between 50 and 70 percent. Uh, remember that you need to give some CPU to the JVM, operating system, and so on. And of course, you have to take into account the, mem the available memory and other resource limits. What about the synchronous uh, systems? So we talked about synchronous systems, and uh, usually when I talk about synchronous systems, someone always tells me, oh, you should use a sync system, then you won't have all, the, all of those problems with, uh, with queues. Unfortunately, Asynchronous systems also have a queue. Uh, this is the basic architecture of asynchronous servers. You have, again, some web server, load balancer, whatever. Um, it talks to your server over the network. You have a socket. You have a queue here. Fine. And then you have the event loop. So an asynchronous system would have an event loop that basically calls epoch. It's a, a nice uh, system call in Linux that um, allows you to pull on multiple sockets at once. Uh, very efficient. And once you have sockets ready and you can use them, you would call, you would uh, read or write or whatever you have to do with the sockets um, from the operating system. This is a system call activated by the event loop. And once you have the data in, the, in your buffers, then you can finally activate the user code, your code. And it waits here in the callback queue. So when you write a callback, it goes in the callback queue, and the event loop would finally, at some point, will uh, take the callback out of the callback queue and handle it. This means that all of your code is waiting on one giant queue here. And what happens if the queue gets too large? Latency. So you have the same problem, but it's actually much worse. Why is it much worse? First of all, the callback uh, queue is unbounded, which means it's very easy if you have overload to get into an out-of-memory situation in a synchronous server. Okay, and I've seen this happen in Node.js many, many times. Um, remember that the event loop can block. Why, can, uh, why would the event, uh, the event loop block? Any ideas? Sorry? Doing what? Yeah, so CPU is blocking. There's nothing you can do about that. CPU is always blocking. If someone, for some reason, in a, in a callback, um, makes a heavy computation, it will block all the requests, and it will cause high latency for all the requests. Also, a little known fact, uh, system calls in Linux are also blocking. If some system call takes long, um, very long to complete, 
the entire system will be blocked. All the event queue, sorry, all of the event loop and the callback queue. Another problem is that there's no inherent concurrency limit in a synchronous uh, server. Yes, you can make one. You can create your own system to limit concurrency, but by default, there is no such system. In a threaded server, it's pretty, pretty easy to limit the concurrency. You just tune the number of threads available. That's all you have to do. And also, no back pressure by default. The reason there's an asterisk is because you can use reactive streams, which actually help with this. What happens when you have overload in a synchronous system? Um, because we don't have preemption, there's no way to stop an ongoing computation. That means that we don't have quality of service. If some callback uh, blocks the event loop, you're going to have high latency for all of the requests, not just one of them. Uh, in a threaded server, if one thread blocks this in blo on the CPU, it will be kicked out after some time, and other th uh, threads will be able to complete their work in a reasonable time, uh, in a timely manner, which basically means that you do have you know, decent quality of service behavior in a threaded server. And of course, because there's no back pressure, it's pretty easy to, to get into overload. Also, it's very hard to tune, a lot of tuning param parameters, how to limit concurrency and queue size, and so on. So what's the point? Why is everyone uh, using synchro uh, synchronous servers? First of all, because they're very efficient for high concurrency. Um, you don't, in threaded system, for every connection that you hold open, you have to uh, allocate memory for the entire th stack of the thread. Uh, this means run one megabyte in uh, Java. For an asynchronous server, you just have to allocate um, the, the request objects. That can be tens of kilobytes. Also, you have more control. You can, you have, fine-grained control of the timeouts, which is also very nice. And for IO-heavy servers, uh, because we have more efficient system calls we can use, this means less context switches. But this is actually a very, very rare case. This whole paradigm is still evolving. Um, you have to remember that the operating systems we use were designed for synchronous servers and not for synchronous servers. So maybe in a few years, the situation will be better, I hope. Let's talk about Little's Law. Uh, Little's law is um, a statistical law that was designed for queued systems, but also systems in general. And it was very hard to prove mathematically, despite the fact that it seems pretty obvious. So this is Little's law. Uh, basically, it, it has a, it's a, the relation between the average number of clients in the system or the clients in queued inside the system, or concurrency, if you will. Um, that equals the average throughput times the average latency. Okay, it seems pretty obvious, pretty straightforward. It was actually very, very hard to prove um, mathematically because it holds for all distributions. And this is where the power of Little's Law comes from because you can apply it almost everywhere, universally. Um, it holds for stable systems. I'm not going to go into the mathematical definition of stable. You can think of it as not changing too much over time. And it holds for systems and those subsystems, which means that we can apply it to the system and then to the subsystems and compare. And from that, we can get a lot of insights. So what do we do with Little's Law? Um, first of all, we would answer questions that we cannot answer with direct monitoring. Often, you don't have the ability to monitor the size of a queue, for example. So the only way to infer how many clients are queued inside the system would be using Little's Law. You can measure the throughput, which is usually the same in all of your system. The throughput would usually be the same for the, the subsystem and the overall system. So you can measure it once. And you can measure the, the latency per subsystem or per the overall system. And from there, you can just derive using uh, Little's Law how many clients are inside each part of the system. Okay, even if you don't have direct measurement. The second thing that you can do with it is verify load tests, metrics, benchmarks, and so on. And you would be amazed how many load generators and how many load testing tools actually give you the wrong numbers. And if you start verifying the benchmarks and load tests using Little's Law, you would find that many, many, many tools are just misbehaving. Maybe they don't, ha they don't uh, have enough concurrency to apply the load that you, that you tried to, uh, to generate, or maybe they have some pr other problem inside. And the way to detect that is using Little's Law. 
Also, it helps with debugging, system analysis, capacity planning, and so on, so on, so on. Okay? I'll give you an example. You can calculate the actual latency the clients observe okay, using Lita's law without having the ability to measure it, because usually you can't measure it for the browser or the client side. Okay? Um, I would highly recommend that you, you uh, take a look at this. This is an example. Uh, this is an academic paper where they applied Lita's law to, um, to verify benchmarks. That's a pretty nice example. So let's give an example of uh, stuff that we can learn by analyzing systems using Lita's law. So let's say we have a cluster of machines, and one of the machines is failing. And we have a load balancer using the list connections algorithm. And when a machine fails, it starts returning errors very, very fast. Okay? Usually, let's say that, that the latency here is 100 milliseconds, 1 uh, uh, 0.1 uh, seconds. And this is like the normal latency. And when a server it starts returning errors, it would return errors very fast. Let's say uh, one millisecond. Okay? What Lita's law tells us after we derive this, okay? remember the throughput is the same. Uh, sorry, not the throughput. In this case, uh, because of the least connections algorithm that we used, the number of connections or the number of uh, clients in the system would be the same for all the servers. Okay? So uh, we can... Um, just arrived this formula, which tells us that the faulty server would receive 100 more times more throughput than the other servers. Okay, now think about this. If you have 10 servers and one of them failed, you would expect to have 10% failure rate, right? This tells us that in fact we would have closer to 98% failure rate from one server. Okay, that's horrible. There are two ways to protect against this. First, we can just use another algorithm, like random or, um, or uh, sharding or something like that, instead of the least connections algorithm. Or we could throttle the servers so they don't receive too much traffic when they go haywire. Okay? But we have to do one of them. Otherwise, when you have one uh, faulty server, it's probably going to take out your entire service, which is really, really bad. Kind of defeats the purpose of, uh, of redundancy, I would say. Now, this is the last part of the, of the talk, um, timeouts. Um, this is also something that many, many people uh, do wrong uh, when they try to do resilient design. Things that I've seen in the wild. Arbitrary timeout values. You know, the, when you look at the code and you see timeout value one second. That's a bogus number, right? Any number that is a multiple of 10 is usually bogus. Um, because that's not how numbers work in the real world. Um, I've seen like horrendous things. Database timeout that is over the overall timeout. That doesn't make any sense, right? Like you're not going to wait for the database longer than the, uh, than the timeout for the client. Um, cache timeout larger than database latency. Like why would you go to memcache and wait one second when the database returns uh, you know queries in 20 milliseconds? Like the whole point of memcache is to be faster than database. And yet I've seen this many, many times. Um, huge unrealistic timeouts. Why? Because people are refusing to return errors. That's, that's, again, the basic mistake. People are trying to optimize for low number of errors, and that's wrong. And by the way, connection timeouts, read timeouts, and transaction timeouts are like completely different from one another. They should have very different values. Um, if you don't know what they mean, go and read about them. So how do you decide on a timeout? You look at the distribution. This is how. You get a histogram, or you get the percentiles, you look at the histogram, you look for models and for modes, because often you would have more than one mode, okay, or more than one peak in the histogram. And based on the histogram, you can actually see um, how many errors you would have, how many timeouts you would have for each value of timeout that you decide on. Okay? This is how you decide on timeout. Um, I like to use a cumulative distribution chart, but uh, you know, feel free to use whatever you want. But also remember that every transaction has context. Usually there's some business context. For example, uh, for certain operations, let's say audit log, you cannot time out. Why? Because regulation. This is the law. You cannot time out for this. Okay, 
So after you have the distribution and the business context, you can make some informed decision about timeout. And the basic principle is that every timeout should have some relation to real-world constraints. It should not be arbitrary. Okay? What kind of real-world constraints? For example, most of our systems deal with humans, and humans have physical constraints. Okay? So it makes sense that the timeouts and the, and the SLA that we give uh, our services would relate to those numbers. For example, the perception uh, depth and the perception threshold of a human being is about 20 milliseconds. This is why for smooth movies and, and uh, games, we need 60 frames per second. Okay? Um, another example is the immediate reaction threshold, 100 milliseconds. After that, you have to give some visual feedback or haptic feedback. Um, delay perception threshold. After that, people actually feel like they did the work, not the computer. So think about autocomplete, for example. If you want autocomplete to be smooth, it has, it has to be less than 100 milliseconds. And this is a hard requirement because of the way people behave. Okay? Um, if you're talking about spinners, when you should put those uh, nice spinners, anything above one uh, second. Okay? Um, you get the point. Hardware, also physical limitation that we have to take into account. Uh, speed of light is not going to change. Okay? Some of the numbers are going to change because of technology. For example, you see the difference between magnetic disk and uh, SSD. Okay? But again, those are hard numbers. If you're working inside a data center, okay, then this is the, the time you should take into account when you're dealing with connection timeouts. Okay? If we're talking about uh, 1.5, sorry, 0.5 milliseconds per round trip, then the whole TCP handshake should take maybe two milliseconds. Okay? That means that the timeout value for connection should be in the order of magnitude of 10, 20 milliseconds. Okay? Definitely not one second, which is a value I see all the time. Okay? And so on, so on, so on. There's a nice table you can find on GitHub of all the numbers uh, of hardware, and it's very, very helpful when you're designing timeouts. Now, there's a very helpful pattern that we use for microservices. It's called timeout budgets. And basically, the idea is that in a microservices architecture, uh, you might have some services that time out in an arbitrary way that is not uh, related to where they are in the call graph. Okay? Uh, and then you would have a situation where uh, one microservice, usually you know, deep down, would have a timeout value that is unrealistic for the entire transaction. Maybe it's larger than the entire transaction, or maybe it's way smaller. What you actually want to have is adaptive timeout based on how much uh, time the client is willing to wait and how much time you spend on other operations. So what you do is you propagate a timeout budget. You decide on a timeout budget upfront based on the timeout for the client. Okay, this would be in the front layer. And then you do something, you subtract the time it took, and you propagate that value to the other, to the other services. So in this example, uh, for example, let's say authorization took six milliseconds, you subtract it from the overall timeout uh, budget, which is 500 milliseconds, and you propagate this value forward. And you derive the timeouts based on uh, the propagated value. So you cannot exceed the budget. And if, for some reason, you are out of budget, you stop handling the transaction. You don't pass it forward to other microservices because there's no point. Okay? So you save on resources, and you have better timeouts. Um, another example of a pattern that you can apply in microservices architecture, this is um, more relevant to asynchronous systems, is the debt buyer. Basically, you have some transaction that timed out. But just because it timed out and you don't return a response to the client or you return an error to the client, that doesn't mean that the underlying operation won't complete. So you can still listen to the underlying operation. And if and when it completes, you can do something useful with response. Maybe you can correct the records that this wasn't an error. Or maybe you can trigger some asynchronous other asynchronous operation but the point is, you don't just let it, the response go into the void, which is usually what people do when there's a timeout. Okay? Uh, how do you do this? You continue um, uh, listening for the response on a future or some other asynchronous callback uh, mechanism. 
That's the general idea. Um, this can't be used when the client is actually expecting the data back. You can't lie. That's basically the idea. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, now would be a good time.